Welcome to the Evolved Caveman, where men learn to be successful and happy with your host, Dr. John Schinnerer, as he shares the most impactful ideas and practices for you to get the most from your relationships, your work, and from your life. Now, here's Dr. John. Hello again, this is Dr. John Schinner, and welcome to the latest episode of The Evolved Caveman. And today, I am really honored and pleased to have as my guest, Paul Kibble. And Paul is a social justice educator, activist, and writer, and has been an innovative leader in violence prevention for more than 45 years. He is an accomplished trainer and speaker on men's issues, racism and diversity, challenges of youth, family violence, raising boys to manhood, and the impact of class and power on daily life. His work gives people the understanding to become involved in social justice work and the tools to become more effective allies in community struggles to end oppression and injustice and to transform organizations and institutions. Paul is the author of numerous books, including Uprooting Racism, How White People Can Work for Racial Justice, which won the 1996 Gustavus Myers Award for Best Book on Human Rights, Men's Work, My Personal Favorite, Helping Teens Stop Violence, and most recently, You Call This a Democracy? Who benefits, who pays, and who really decides? His work is guided by one primary question. How can we live together to sustain community, nurture each individual, and create a multicultural society based on love, caring, justice, and interdependence with all living things? Paul, thank you so much for being here. How are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. It's good to be with you. So let's jump right in and go to your origin story. So how did you get involved in this? Because my attachment to you is through the book Men's Work and the Man Box Culture idea. But I know you've done, you've been in numerous areas in social justice. So how did you get involved in this work? I became an activist in college um, in the late 1960s, uh, participating in the movement to end the war against Vietnam and uh, on my college campus uh, doing racial justice work in support of the black students on the campus. And that was my kind of uh, opening uh, understanding um, of what's really going on in our society and what what kinds of attacks people are under, um, both internationally and locally, and uh, also what does it mean for me as a white male to show up as an ally and try to support what's going on. Uh, from there, um, I, uh, uh, I left the country for a while to travel and came back and the women's movement was in full uh, blossom. Um, and per, I, I moved to the San Francisco Bay Area and a group of us who were men in, in this area uh, were listening to women in our lives uh, who were angry and outraged at the levels of male violence that they were experiencing. Women who were setting up domestic violence shelters and rape prevention programs, sexual um, uh, child sexual assault programs. And we went to some of them and asked, you know, what could we do? And they said, well, uh, we're dealing with the survivors of male violence and our hands are full, but it's men who are doing the violence and you're men. So work with the men, talk with the men, intervene. And so we started a project in the late 1970s, um, which became the Oakland Men's Project. Um, And the, the kind of the motto of the Oakland Men's Project was men's work to stop male violence. And we started talking with uh, adult men, but we quickly became, uh, got invited into schools to work with young, young men, young men and women together around issues of dating violence, family violence, things like that. So um, we went in with a very simple message uh, to the young men. Uh, You're hitting your girlfriends, that's wrong, and therefore stop it. And um, this is in the Bay Area, uh, multiracial, multi-class, very diverse schools. Um, and uh, young men didn't respond very enthusiastically to us being in there. <laughs> Not surprisingly, but we took seriously what they were saying. And they were saying basically two things. They were saying, uh, yeah, sometimes we do hit our girlfriends, but if you're serious about helping us deal with the violence in our lives, we have to look at uh, 
the family violence. We have to look at sexual violence. We have to look at gay bashing, um, hate crimes, uh, various forms of interpersonal violence because it's all interconnected. And then they were saying, look at the state of our schools. Look at the toxic dumping in our neighborhoods. Look at the racial profiling uh, in our communities. Uh, it's not just the interpersonal violence, it's also the institutional daily kinds of violence that we're up against. And so we had to take that really seriously um, and really rethink at the very core of what we were doing and that we couldn't just pick a, a little slice of an issue and, and say, this is it that we had to understand the complexity of people's lives, the intersections of people's situations and identities and positions. And so over the, the, the 80s and 90s, when the Oakland Men's Project was live, we did a lot of work um, training folks to do this work, um, looking at multiple issues, systems of oppression, how do we show up as allies, um, what is it, you know, how does it impact us in our daily lives? Uh, all of that kind of stuff. So the, those are, that's kind of the arc of the origins of my work. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. So, I mean, it's interesting to me because being in psychology, my main emphasis has been on the individual. And I think you've looked at the many different layers involved in some of these problems. And so I'm really curious to get into some of the issues to hear you talk about the variety of layers there. So one of the things that's been on my mind recently is we've had, you know, two mass shootings this past weekend. And I think more, we've had more mass shootings per day this year. So there's more mass shootings in our days of the year this year in 2019. So let's talk a little bit about the mass shootings and how one layer that comes to my mind is how we're socialized in terms of the man box culture. And then as you've mentioned, there's also many other layers to that. Okay, you're asking a, a complicated question, so yes. I'll take it apart a little bit. Um, so let's start with male socialization because a, a, one root of the, the violence in our society is certainly the, no matter what kind of violence we look at, whether it's interpersonal violence or institutional violence or hate crimes or mass shootings or uh, war, we're looking at male-driven, male-controlled violence that is um, decided by men in power and carried out by usually men without much power uh, in form various forms of violence. And that's not inevitable, it's not biological, it's the result of a um, patriarchal society in which boys are systematically trained to be in what we've come to call the act like a man box to be tough, aggressive, in charge, don't show your feelings, don't make mistakes, don't ask for help. Be inside this box 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we know it's a box because every time a boy steps out of it, um, you, we know the names that get called, punk, sissy, fag, gay, all of that stuff, wimp, mama's boy. But we also know the beatings, the bullying, the, the kind of the larger kind of scale of enforcement that, that is directly violent. So when we talk about violence, um, whether it's mass shootings or other things, we have to kind of start with that interpersonal level. And for those of us who are socialized as men, um, and through that process, we have to look at what we've learned. We have to unlearn that socialization and really do that personal work. But gender oppression and racism, other systems operate on other levels besides the interpersonal. Well, one of them is the institutional level, the way these hierarchies of power and exploitation and violence get built into our, our institutions, our healthcare system, our criminal legal system, the, the schools, uh, the military, all of that stuff. So we have to look at how the policies and practices and procedures of those institutions operate to advantage white people over people of color, men over women, uh, those with more wealth or education over those who have less, for example. Then there's another level, which is the structural level, which is the way that all of those institutions work together in our daily lives to provide almost like a web of of systems of oppression that reinforce each other. 
So we don't just operate in a school, but we're also in the healthcare system or all, the school is tied to the criminal legal system and the police. Um, and so that um, we have to look at how all of those systems interact into a structure of racism or a structure of sexism. So how do you think all that culminates in someone becoming a mass shooter? How does it? Yeah. It does. If we bring yeah. it down to that individual level, I mean, for instance, I was thinking about, so I, if we start off with the act like a man or act like a man box culture, um, it seems to me that two thirds of the emotional spectrum get cut off, for, cut off from us when we're growing up. So if you show too much fear or sadness, it's stop being a pussy. If you show too much excitement, joy, romanticism, love, it's stop being gay, don't be a fag. And so if you're smart and sensitive, you learn really quickly, I'm not going to show those parts of myself, I'm going to cut them off and repress them. And so we men are left with something like anger, some degree, frustration, irritation, annoyance, rage, and then lust and stress. I think those are the three emotions that we can safely show without fear of being humiliated. And the mm -hmm. problem with that is that I mean, I've been doing a lot of research on anger the past 15 years, and when we're angry or irritable, nothing's our fault. Everything, blame for everything is put on other people. And so it cuts us off from the ability to learn and be curious. And, and then, and I've talked to a lot of 20-something males who, you know, I would say life hasn't gone the way that they wanted. They're lonely, they're frustrated, they're angry, which makes them ripe for these alt-right views. And then, you know, to me, it's kind of reinforced by some of the rhetoric coming out of the White House, which I think, you know, you combine that with some of these 8chan or 4chan kind of sites, and it gives them the idea that to do something like a mass shooting is pro-social or even heroic at some level, that they're doing society a favor. I think that's true. Um, I think that... There's a couple other factors that I think are important. One is the cultural level that we have a, a, a deep history and, and, a series, and a bunch of institutions, the media, our schools, our religious institutions that promote a culture of men, of male power, mm -hmm. of white male power in particular. Um, and so everywhere we look as boys, as young men, we see images of men in power who solve problems by being angry and using violence um, and save the day and rescue the women in distress and save other peoples. Um, and so it's, it's that, that socialization is reinforced at every turn at that mm -hmm. cultural level. But the other thing is that we have, um, that culture is directing our attention constantly at certain groups of people, um, immigrants, Muslims, women, folks who are queer and trans, whatever. And so we also um, build in a, a tremendous amount of sense of righteousness, entitlement, um, and the sense that other people are dangerous, that they're a threat, and that the only solution is violence. Um, but it's easy to look at mass shooters um, it's harder to look at the everyday realities of male violence in our lives because when we look at the far right or the extremists or fundamentals or whoever and blame them, then we can avoid any kind of responsibility. But um, as men, there's tremendous violence in our interpersonal relationships, um, for instance. Um, there's tremendous, there's everyday ways that we reinforce racial hierarchies that we discriminate or marginalize or exclude people of color from our circles if we're white. If we're men, we're constantly doing things that interrupt or belittle or disrespect women. Um, that uh, it's really important that we don't kind of, in some sense, almost glamorize the mass shooters as the, the problem because it's the everyday reality of uh, our lives that this mostly gets enacted about. And, and you and I and the pe other uh, males around us are perpetuating and colluding with, collaborating with. Well, and, and I think, you know, to your point, it's, it's fascinating to me because we do perpetuate it and we're so, that, that man box culture is so closely 
held as part of our identity that it's hard to even see oneself as separate from the socialization process. It's hard to see myself as separate at times from how I was brought up, how I was raised. And, and so I think just to get a little bit of gap between how I was socialized and who I might be other than that is a big deal. And, and the other point that comes up is it's hard also, like, I, I think that, you know, it's easy for me to say, oh, well, I've never physically abused a woman. So I'm, I'm not part of that. But then I look at, well, what about emotionally? And I know that there's times in the past when I've had to work to manage my anger, sometimes not so successfully or not as successfully as I'd like. And that enters into it as well. So part of this comes even down to the level of emotional management. Well, certainly that's true. Um, but we, 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 we need to have much higher expectations for men. Uh, the goal is not just to get us to stop abusing women. The goal is to actually work for gender justice and, and attack any inequality of wages and the exploitation of women's work and the lack of safety that women experience and lack of access. So we need to say, talk about more than just how do we become good men, or whatever that means, um, and, and what is our responsibility when our lives are based on the exploitation and violence against other people? So if, if you think about who made your clothes, if you think about who grew the food and processed the food that you had this morning, if you think about who made your computers and cell phones and, and who cares for the sick and the elderly and people with disabilities in our society, it's overwhelmingly women and particularly women of color, um, as well as other marginalized groups that, that do that work that's low paid, disrespected, mostly invisible to us. What does it say about us as, as um, people of integrity if we are not working for justice, if we're not addressing those problems as well as just trying not to hurt anybody. <laughs> so go more into the idea of what it means for a man to be an ally to a movement like this. How can we, how can we best serve? Well, one of the places to start is with that personal attention. Think, looking at examining our own socialization and the messages we've learned. And, um, because if we don't do that, then when we show up to be an ally, to act as an ally, then we just carry all that stuff with us, that same sense of entitlement, of, of being in control, of being superior to. So the personal work is an, an important place mm -hmm. to do the work. Part of that means listening to women, to, men, to people of color, to people who are queer and trans people with disabilities, people who are marginalized, because they, they are writing and saying a lot about what we need to be doing and what's wrong with what's going on. So one of the stages of steps is really listening to those outside of our regular experience. We live in tremendously segregated worlds, and, and, but it's not difficult to change that to actually bring those voices into our lives. Um, another thing is to look at where people are actually on the front lines of struggle. Um, we need to look at Black Lives Matter and uh, the indigenous folks at Sandy Rock and the Im immigrants struggling at the borders and um, the people who uh, in the Me Too movement and the people fighting for reproductive justice throughout this country. And, and actually turn our attention and support and leverage our resources towards the, the struggles for social justice. And tell me a little bit about the issue of reproductive justice and how that figures into all this. Well, one of the, the long standing ways that women are disempowered um, and, and men have tried to control women's lives is through um, control of women's reproductive capabilities and their roles as mothers. And so reproductive justice is uh, the understanding that women should have control over their decisions to have children, to not have children, and to raise those children in safe and healthy and, and sustainable conditions. Um, and so that's a, a pivotal um, you know, the exploitation of women around reprodu their reproductive roles is one of the pillars of gender exploitation. Mm -hmm. 
And then the other thing that comes to mind is how do we encourage more men of privilege to get involved and to take action? Well, I think that it starts with one-on-one -on -one conversations. It starts with us um, addressing the men around us and saying, you know, these are some things I've been thinking about and what have you been thinking about and, and how do you feel about what's going on and the attacks on uh, abortion rights or the attacks on the prevalence of sexual assault or the, the systematic daily police shootings of unarmed people of color um, or the children in cages on, the, on our borders in detention camps. Um, we need to break the silence. Uh, part of the way these systems work is complicity. And as men, uh, we are right smack in the middle of that complicity of silence. Uh, we're often afraid to bring up these conversations. We're, um, we're uneasy. Uh, we hear comments. We're around other men a lot. And we hear things, uh, ideas and thoughts and comments they make, and we don't say anything. We don't talk about these issues. And so... One of the ways that we have to step up is to interrupt the sexism and racism and, and other things we see and to break the silence. Hmm. And you're, this, this podcast is a great example of that. You, this is what you're trying to do is to break that silence and mm -hmm. bring these topics to the center and give people tools for having those conversations. So let's circle back to masculinity and, and what is, what does positive masculinity look like to you? Well, there's a lot of ways that... He's gotten hammered a lot lately, you know, toxic masculinity, which toxic, is the phrase... Toxic that, masculinity. I don't is, like uh, that phrase because I think it shuts a lot yeah. of men down and makes them un, puts them undefensive. Mm -hmm. But I do like the conversation about what... Because I, I do think there's a lot of positives about masculinity, and I think we need to tweak it a little bit too, tweak our understanding of it, kind of what is it we'd like to lop off, what is it we'd like to add on moving forward. Yeah, it's a tricky subject. Um, there's m multiple ways that people have been men in our societies, in our cultures, in our geographical communities, in our religious traditions. So there, there's lots and lots of different role models that we can draw on. But I think the, the core issue is that there really isn't a gender binary, that almost anything we could say there was a male quality, women and people who did identify as non-binary also exhibit. And there are no fe biologically female qualities. There's, there's physiological qualities about being able to bear children. But outside of that, we need to be looking at what does it mean to be fully human? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and step back from this holding on to masculinity as something because the harder we hold on to it, the more it becomes a fist or a wedge or something we use to try to enforce people into some kind of limited box. So uh, 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 positive masculinity can also become an act like a man box mm. um, that maybe it does less damage, but it's no less constricting and it continues to enforce that gender binary system that we know is not uh, an accurate portrayal of the real world. Yeah, I like the idea of just embracing, for instance, every emotion that we feel as human and not exactly. labeling them as masculine or feminine so that we can become more full spectrum men, for full spectrum human. Um, right. and, and, and I and think it allows women and uh, female identified folks and queer and trans folks also to claim that's those same qualities. Hmm. So one of the solutions to the act like a man box culture is to transcend the labels, transcend the binary thinking. Well, I think that that's part of it. Um, and, and we know that one of the ways the box is enforced is by um, attacking men for not being real men, for being boys or girls or, or fags or homosexuals, that the box, the part of the enforcement of the box is that binary. If you're not a man in that, you know, in that traditional male dominant sense, then what are you, right? 
um, you're inferior, you're weak, you're vulnerable. So we have, we have to question that binary uh, to step out of the box. Well, and it's, it's interesting. I remember, and I, f- I can't remember who came up with this first. It might've been bell hooks, uh, the feminist author, um, who said that masculinity is inherently a negative identity and that it's defined by what is not gay and what is not female. Right. Which is a really restrictive uh, identity. Exactly. Um, and I, I think we can say that about whiteness. Whiteness is only makes sense by defining some people as non-white and inferior. And it becomes an exclusionary, tight, rigid definition of what it means to be human or civilized or a citizen or whatever. A lot, a lot of these categories are just really negative categories to uh, enhance the power uh, of particular groups of people. This is a total tangent, but it just popped to mind. How do you feel about cultural misappropriation then? Well, I think that that's part of how racism has worked traditionally is not just to attack peoples and, and come in terms of genocide and violence and and slavery and things like that, but also to appropriate their cultures, to to destroy their cultures on the one hand and also to appropriate them and assimilate them on the other. So it's very much a tool of how racism works. Well, I guess I'm a little bit confused about this because it seems like if you're looking for a multicultural society, that some of that assimilation is going to happen Regardless, I mean, I think of, you know, New Orleans, for example, where you've just got a blend of different musical styles and food. And I, so I guess I'm a little bit confused about misappropriation. Well, there's, there's always uh, sh- cultural sharing. Mm-hmm. The question is on what terms? Who's, are, are cultures just coming together and sharing and music develops out of, you know, people adapting and drawing on different traditions? Or is there a dominant culture that is exploiting and commodifying and making money off of and, and distorting other people's cultures. So for instance, one of the examples that always comes to my mind is white musicians, white rappers that are kind of taking rap and that's all they do and then making money off of it. That seems to be one of the biggest examples. Right. With no sense of accountability, no recognition of the roots of what they're doing or the complex dynamics. Um, and no sense of returning some of that uh, gain that they get back to the communities that, um, in fact, enable them to be able to be successful in the first place. What if they do have an understanding of the dynamics, the history, and give back to the communities where it originated? Well, that's not for me to decide. That's for those communities to decide. And there, that comes back to who gets, who makes the decisions, and is there... Uh, an equality there is there a, or is there a hierarchy of power and 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 control um, and, and here's where, I, where this so, is interesting so for instance, you. I, you know I, I couldn't say for native american communities or black communities at what point something becomes culturally misappropriated um that's for those communities to decide and i guess this is why it's interesting to me because i think emotionally there's um I don't know if it's a paradox to me. In other words, I love learning about new and different cultures. Mm-hmm. And I think that the idea of cultural misappropriation fills me with a little bit of anxiety and dread. Like, am I doing something wrong by learning about and immersing myself in different cultures? At what point does that become, quote, cultural misappropriation? So maybe the distinction is if I were to take that and make money off of it without well, regard to the community that, that it came from. That, that's certainly a key point. Um, if you were an academic and start writing and gain, and gain a reputation off of it, that would be a different way of appropriating. Um, if, you know, if you become quote, an expert on it um, without accountability to whatever community you're an expert on or whatever culture you're an expert on, there's just, there's various levels of which that something gets misappropriated um, without the consent of the people whose lives this involves. But so, I mean, so if, for instance, if I'm doing the work you're doing, I would have a little bit of hesitation and anxiety about, I can't get everyone's consent. Should I be doing this? Does that, does that make sense? Well, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's a common problem for those of us who are white or male or whatever is that right. we want to do it so right. So perfectly. We don't do anything. 
that we don't do anything, that we get paralyzed. Um, it, there's a good article called White Supremacy Culture um, by Ken Jones and Tema Okun that, that talks about some of the qualities of white culture, mainstream culture. And one of them is this, uh, we can't do anything unless we're perfect. And, it's, and we are afraid to make mistakes. Um, and so obviously that helps no one. Um, you know, we are going to make mistakes. Um, there, we can't just sit away around and wait until we have it right. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to get out there and get involved. And we have to be constantly listening to the feedback, thinking about what we're doing, um, being uh, accountable to the communities that we're working within so that um, it's a process that we learn more and more about as we participate, whether it's in music or, or dance or um, religious, religious uh, you know, uh, uh, circles or whatever. Yeah. And I mean, I, I just think it's a really important point because we've talked about how do we get more men of privilege involved in these movements. And I think one of the things that we're fighting is our own fear and anxiety about putting our foot in our mouths and making a mistake, which I've definitely done. And I will, do again in the future. And it's, you know, one of my great fears is I, I don't want to offend anyone. I'm, I'm trying to serve, but the offense is almost inevitable. Well, to some extent, I mean, th that's why we have to do the personal work and be listening to folks on the front lines because they're telling us a lot about what works and doesn't and what doesn't work and what they need from us and what they don't need. And so, you know, they, they say real specifically, uh, we need your support, but we don't need you to come in and take over. Mm -hmm. We need you to show up and, and, and not expect to be in the limelight. Um, you know, that, that, that we have to really look at some of the ways we've been socialized as white people, as men, as people with education or whatever, to expect certain things. And we have to be willing to be uncomfortable and reexamine those assumptions um, and that's something we can all begin doing, you know, right away. Yeah, I think one of the guidelines that I try to live by is approaching these issues with curiosity and compassion. And, well, and then I think that those are great. Those are great qualities. The one I'd add to that is humility. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think self-compassion, too, in the sense that mm -hmm. I think these are issues that are fraught with landmines and I'm going to step on one occasionally. So I've got to forgive myself and try and do better next time. But if I stay stuck on, you know, how much I screwed up the last time, then I can get stuck there and never move forward and get out of it altogether. Right. Well, I think the other thing that we need to remember is that um, we're complicit one way or the other, that if we're not involved, we're benefiting and supporting the systems of oppression that we're, we're living under. Um, we're still benefiting from the w exploited work uh, um, of, uh, you know, people of color and women. We're still um, benefiting from the land that's native, the Native American land that we're on. And so it, w there's no place where we're not complicit. We're not inside the system. And I think sometimes there's the illusion that if we don't do anything, we won't make mistakes. We're already part of a system that is systematically um, exploiting and violating people. Yeah, making no decision, still a decision, or staying silent is giving your approval to the system. Right. And very often as men, we do that with, we, we sign on to other men's misogyny, um, hatred of women, uh, exploitation, disrespect for women by being silent. When the jokes are told, the comments are made, men act out against women around them, um, we are tacitly collaborating with them by, by signing on to that culture of um, misogyny. Yeah, and, and you know, I was looking through your, your site before I started this uh, interview, and there's an exercise, and I don't know if you can access this right now, but there's um, an exercise in the men's workbook about sort of asking men questions in terms of how they were raised and what they've experienced and having people stand up as you go through the number of questions. Can you, do you remember some of the questions on that questionnaire? 
Um, I can pull it up pretty quickly, I think. Um, I'd like to go through a few of those just to give people an idea of what we're talking about, because I think they're powerful and important. Um, you know, one was things like, have you ever used physical power to dominate someone or to get your way? Yeah. Um, some of them, uh, others are, did you, have you ever worried that you weren't tough enough? Tough enough. Uh -huh. Um, were you ever called a wimp, a queer or a fag? Um, were you ever told to act like a man? Were you ever have, were you ever hit by an older man? Were you ever forced to fight as a young person? Um, and so for listeners, pardon me for interrupting, Paul, for listeners, imagine being in a room of men as these questions are being asked progressively and more and more men stand up and eventually the whole room is standing pretty quickly, I would imagine. Right. And one of the powers of the male socialization is that it happens to each of us individually. And we think that there's something wrong with us that we're not strong enough or we're not tough enough or we're not, you know, prepared enough. And when you do this exercise with boys or young men and they look around the room and they understand for the first time that it's not about them being inadequate. It's about this whole system of socialization. It's a very powerful moment, even for adult men to do it together. Yeah. Um, it's on my website at uh, uh, paulkibble.com. Um, and it's, uh, I really recommend that people use it. Um, if you're in uh, groups with men or, or younger men, um, there's other exercises on the website as well that look at other aspects of that male socialization. Yeah, and I was impressed. There's a lot of resources on your website. Again, paulkivel.com, P-A-U-L-K-I-V-E-L.com. Um, yeah, it's, it's fascinating to me. I, you know, I think that masculinity, the concept and the way we're socialized is really a losing proposition in that I don't know of any man who actually feels that they live up to that high bar because we're always, our masculinity is hard, hard won and easily lost. So it's always dependent on how good was your last achievement, which you can only sustain that for so long. Right. Well, and, and we see it in the high rates of suicide, or high rates of alcohol and other drug abuse, the, the high rates of loneliness, of, uh, the depression, um, the, the impact of this box, of this male socialization is devastating to us as men. Uh, we lead lonely and isolated lives. Often we can't be intimate in our relationships um, because we can't show any feelings or we've lost the uh, ability to even recognize we have feelings. Um, and we turn to various kinds of violence, whether it's against other people around us or uh, self-directed. And so it's not just about, um, you know, externally the impact of this uh, socialization. It's also the, the deep and ongoing cost to ourselves. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I've been dating a therapist for about almost four years now. And I remember when we first started going out, I was, I was grouchy and irritable. I was stressed from work and, you know, I the time for the night came to an end and I went back to my house and, you know, I texted her and just said, Hey, you know, sorry, I was kind of grouchy tonight. It has nothing to do with you. Just kind of overwhelmed at work. And she immediately picked up the phone and said, Hey, listen, my job is to accept all of you, whatever you're feeling good or bad. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, like no one's ever said that to me. And it was this kind of door opening and just, and you know, I, I think I fell in love with her a little bit more that night, mm -hmm. but it was, it was unique and powerful. Right. Well, and part of the box is that we never admit we have feelings. We never admit we need help. We should never ask for help or be vulnerable. So that's an important piece. Well, it's interesting also. I mean, I, I talk with a lot of men about, becoming aware of what your needs are, naming your needs, speaking up for your needs, especially in relationship. But the way that we're socialized as men, we're supposed to be invulnerable and self-reliant. So we're not supposed to have needs and we don't even know what our needs are, which right. that itself leads to irritation and frustration and anger. And we often take it out on women, children, uh, people from marginalized groups around us. So yeah, because they should know what our needs are. They should read our minds. Right. Um, and we, we don't take it out on our bosses. <laughs> no, because shit rolls downhill. 
Exactly. So it has to go. I mean, even in the family, you know, dad comes home, his boss is dumped on him. So he dumps on his wife who dumps on the oldest, who dumps on the youngest, who kicks the dog. Well, and, and unfortunately we also do that socially. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of men are in distress. A lot of men are frustrated, are unable to earn a decent living, uh, don't have health care, can't support families. Um, and they're being directed that, not to the, the white men in power and wealth who are making the decisions that, that disinvest in our communities, but they're being directed to be angry at recent immigrants or Muslims or people who are queer and trans or women or whoever. Um, so we have to also acknowledge that this is happening at the societal level. And that's why so much of the, we're seeing the violence getting acted out in you know, horrific ways in our communities. Well, I think it's an easy play and it, it frustrates me how easy it is for political leaders to speak to and incite fear and anger and create division. And, you know, it's so easy to get people that are disenfranchised or, you know, they've done everything that they feel they're supposed to do to pursue the American dream and it's failed them. And then for someone to put, blame on the quote other whether that's immigrants or gay bi trans it's such an easy play to me and it's frustrating to me that more people don't understand the emotional manipulation behind it i think we, we really have to look to many centuries now of certain groups being demonized and i, I mean that in the kind of the christian sense that mm -hmm you know, seen as outside our community, as other, as dangerous, that it's not just that our current uh, political leaders are creating this, they're tapping into deep-seated aspects of our uh, white European culture um, that uh, we have to really look at and address at a much deeper level than most of us are willing to do. Well, and, and I don't know if you're familiar with, you know, there's, so we've got conscious biases. We've also got unconscious biases. I mean, there's work that's been done at Harvard over the past 15 years or so with the implicit association test, which shows that we're all biased at an unconscious level, which makes sense if you go at it from, you know, an evolutionary perspective, where if you go back several hundred thousand years and we're in a tribe, if someone comes across the plains at us that doesn't look like us in some way, skin color, hair color, eye color, we're going to look at them with more suspicion. And parts of that, I think, have kept, they've stayed alive in our DNA. And so we can't even get past, in order to get past that, we've got to be able to be aware of it and have conversations around it to even begin to tap into that. Well, I, 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 I don't know much about hundreds of thousands of years ago or even tens of thousands of years ago. Um, and I don't know that any of this is all that biological. Different societies have different ways of treating people who are strangers or people who are different. Uh, what I do know is that oh, for the last thousand years in our Western civilization, certain very specific groups have been labeled as mm -hmm. other um, and uh, outside our communities. And that is that is socialized behavior that is it's deep it's long standing but it is not necessarily biological or genetic and i think we have to take responsibility for the fact that it, unless we take responsibility whether it's implicit or explicit that we are perpetuating certain stereotypes and misinformation and lies that have been accepted as normal as true in our society but which are artificial and serve the, their ruling class. And, and I like the idea along those lines of, it's not our fault and it is our responsibility to find exactly. ways to make the world a better place. That, uh, you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of men and I'll, I'll use that line frequently that it's not your fault. Like this is how you were socialized. This is how you learned to be. This is how you learned to survive growing up. So that's not, you're not to blame for that. However, it is your responsibility to become aware of it and to find different ways of being and to work to improve things. Exactly. And that comes back to that. Uh, we were talking about earlier around masculinity um, or humanness <laughs> is 
being able to take responsibility for where we are and what's going on around us to be a contributing member of the community and addressing what's wrong and, and um, working with those who are under attack to change the circumstances of that, that is part of our natural human uh, abilities and uh, uh, interests and sympathies. All right, Paul, so I'm, I'm aware of time and we've got to wrap up in the next five minutes or so. Is there anything that I should have asked you but did not? Anything you would like to add? I think we've covered a lot. Um, I, I think that it's really important for those of us who are men. We're in a very pivotal time in the sense that there's a lot of people out in the front lines working for change in our society, <clears throat> trying to address some of the deep rooted systems of oppression that we've been living under that have led us to this point of tremendous amounts of violence, mass shootings. We're fighting wars in multiple countries around the world. Um, we're destroying the land um, and the environment. Um, and so it's a time for those of us who are men to step up and find our place in those struggles. How do we leverage our resources? And I think that besides just doing the work and having the conversations, we need to look at where do we direct our money? Where do we direct our time? Where do we direct our uh, uh, resources that we have in terms of information, of connections, of uh, transportation, of all, uh, how do we amplify the voices of those on the front lines? That there's a lot of very specific things that ways that we can leverage our resources um, towards the struggles for social justice that are happening around us and set, really step in, lean in and get involved and find out what, where we can be most useful. Yeah, it makes me think, you know, you're talking in a sense about prioritization of time and energy and resources and money. It also makes me think of that we need to prioritize our attention too, because I see a lot of like men in their 20s that put their attention into gaming or I don't know, kinds of music that maybe are divisive or rhetoric that's divisive. And I think the more that we can be aware of how we're using our attention, where we're putting our attention and perhaps put it towards uh, education, podcasts, like learning, becoming curious, becoming more aware. I think that's part of it as well. Absolutely. Um, the ruling class likes nothing better than to, not, on the one hand, divide us, but on this, the other hand, to distract us. Yeah. Um, and so we have video games, we have uh, spectator sports, we have television, we have um, Bachelor. elections, <laughs> um, we have pornography. Pornography is a big distraction for, for men. Um, we just have um, a lot of different systems that are both profit making systems for those with the, who are, you know, already have a lot of wealth and power, but they also distract us from looking around, making real connections with people, getting involved in our communities. And so you're right. We have to look at where we put our attention and how much of it is consumed in ways that just feed the system. All right. So are there other social media outlets where people can go to get a hold of you or check out your work? Uh, the main one is my website. Okay. Uh, and there's contact information there. People want to get in touch. There's information about the various books and curricula, um, as well as lots of articles and links and other resources. Fantastic. Well, Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I really enjoyed it. And I, I can't thank you enough for the work that you've done over your lifetime. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be part of the conversation and people can reach me at paulkibble.com. All right. And that does it for today's episode of the Evolved Caveman. Thank you for listening to the Evolved Caveman podcast. If you like what you've heard, support us by subscribing, leaving reviews, and sharing the podcast with friends and colleagues. For the latest, most powerful tools to connect with like-minded men, join the Facebook group at The Evolved Caveman. Follow Dr. John on Instagram at The Evolved Caveman, all one word, or join the email list by visiting guidetoself.com. 